Good morning. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Good morning. Hello, good morning. Welcome. We will be starting shortly. All right, it seems like everyone is already connected. Good morning, good morning. Welcome to our pre-certification workshop. At this time, we like to give business owners a chance to pitch their business while we are waiting. <laughs> if there is anyone out there that would like to tell us a little bit about their business, tell us where they are, where they're located, um, the services and products that you may provide. Quick and easy, just a quick pitch. If you guys would like to um, join in with us this morning, please feel free. Who would like to be the first person to do so? This is a great opportunity for you to let anyone in the room know exactly what your business is, what you provide. There may be someone on this call that needs your services. I can start. Hi there. My name is Cheryl Kroon, and I am just starting an independent education consulting business. Um, I have over 30 years in admissions at private institutions and secondary institutions, so I'm, I would like to help families navigate that admissions process, uh, financial aid, and um, so that's what I'm working on getting that, that business up and running. Fantastic. Thank you, Cheryl. Where, where's your business located? I'm in Cleveland Heights. Perfect. Thank you. If you could put your information into the chat so that everyone here on this call could, could see that information and know how to get in contact with you. Thank you for sharing. Anyone else would like to let us know a little bit about yourself and your business? This is a time for you to pitch your business to the people and the participants on this call. I see you smiling, Gina Jones. Would you like to share? <laughs> Welcome everyone to our pre-certification workshop. At this time, good we morning. are- Uh-huh, okay, oh, good would you like to go on? Yes, ma'am. Good morning, my name is Kent Weiser. My company is KJ Management uh, Consulting. And just like my uh, predecessor there, I do educational consulting and diversity and inclusion training. And I'm located in Cleveland Heights. Perfect. Thank you, Ken. Make sure you put your information into the chat. Will do. Please provide phone numbers and emails, people. <laughs> that would help very much with people trying to get in contact with you. <laughs> Can you hear me? Oh, I can hear you, Gina. Okay. Come on. I didn't realize I needed to unmute myself. Um, <laughs> my name is Gina Jones, and my business is um, Anime Naturals. And it's not located in Cleveland Heights, but it is a CBD business. So um, it's still fairly new to the industry. Um, CBD is actually new to the industry. It was just legalized in 2018. So I'm still kind of navigating through the business right now, but I'm really learning how to, I, I really want to just learn how to do um, contracts with the government and that sort of thing. So that's what I want to do. And I will put my business information in the system. Fantastic. Thank you so much for sharing. That's exciting. Your services could be used. <laughs> Anyone else would like to share their business, what you do, what you provide? So take this as a, a hello, everyone. I just want to say, take this as an opportunity to market your business at no cost to you. You know, when someone comes to you and say, tell me about your business, you have the opportunity, you have the floor to share with whoever that is that you're talking to. And right now you have a platform of um, over 20 people 
who are here to hear about your businesses, the services that you offer, and you never know how many people those 20 people are going to tell. So this is definitely an opportunity. Be ready anytime someone says, tell me about your business. And I'm excited to learn about new businesses. I'm excited to learn about our existing businesses and even pay patronize with our businesses, especially our minority owned businesses who are on this call. So it's really important for you all to share with us who you are, what you do, where you're located in order to help your business grow. So come on, share with us who's out there, um, who want to tell us, you know, if you're still in that ideation phase and you haven't started your business yet, we understand. But if you're an existing business, be proud to brag on your business. Tell us what you do. Absolutely. Great point, Shoshana. Fantastic. Who would like to go next? I don't mind sharing. Hey, Andrea. Hi. Hello, Isaac. <laughs> <laughs> so, hey, everybody. My name is Isaac, um, located in Cleveland. I have a business called I Will Create Media. Um, and what I do in simplest terms is just help nonprofits and small businesses to leverage video and photography content. So I help with social media content. Um, I make co commercials for companies like Pristine Clean, The Gutter Boys, and things like that. Um, but basically, video and photography and consulting. Fantastic. Yes. Please reach out to Isaac. He's fantastic. Make sure you put your information in the chat. Anyone else would like to, to tell us a little bit about yourself and your business? Elements of a pitch. I would like to just share for just a second because some people you find that you guys just don't know how to um, concisely share what you do and what type of services you provide. So just to go over a few pointers for you. So elements of a great pitch, you wanna make sure that your message is clear, it's concise. You provide your value proposition. You wanna make sure that you explain your services and your products, what makes you unique what differentiates your business from other businesses that may be in your same industry or market. So those are key components that you definitely want to add to your pitch. And then you want to always close with some type of call to action, just letting um, participants or people in, within your audience know exactly where to locate you. So at this time, given what I just stated about the, your elements of a pitch, anyone else want to go and try out for this? Let us know about your business, your services and products that you provide. Good morning. My name is Sarah Williams, and I am an alternative educational consultant. And what that means is that I provide private teachers uh, in home for working families who want to homeschool but just can't because they're either working inside of the home as entrepreneurs or outside of the home. Um, I also create micro schools and learning pods um, for communities. I'm a homeschool mom. I am also a veteran teacher, a master teacher, and I am looking forward to helping families this school year. We don't know what in the world is going on, um, but I'm excited. So um, my email address and information I can put in the chat. Um, if you wanna just find me um, as far as my website is foundationsed.org and I will put everything um, into the chat for you. Fantastic. Good morning, Thank Sarah. You. We have Good to reconnect. We, we haven't spoken in a while. We need to reconnect. Sure. Yes, for sure. Thank you. Good to see you. Good to see you too. So Richard, we just went over the elements of a, of a pitch, if you would like to add anything to that while we wait on more takers. Yes, I mean, it, it's great to be able to pitch. Thank you, thank you for that, Andrea. It's so good to be able to pitch your business because it lets people know that you know your business. I mean, you have something to offer. It's important to be comfortable with pitching your business because that is your business. And so uh, people wanna know why they should do business with you. So when you have your elevator pitch down and you, you have to work on it, I mean, it lets people know like, yes, this is a person that I may be interested in doing business with because of the way you pitch your business, the way you deliver your business. It's important, you know, I, I like to tell my daughters, um, you have to, first you have to discover your, your gift, you know, and so you can apply this to your business as well. You discover your gift, then you develop it, and then you deliver. So that's the same thing with the pitch. You, you know your business. I mean, so you should be comfortable as Shoshana said, 
telling people about your business. Every opportunity that you get, you know, you should be comfortable saying, yeah, this is what my business has to offer. I have something of value, something of worth, and you want to do business with me. So, I mean, that's one thing I just like to add to that. So don't be shy. This is your chance. If you're not comfortable with your pitch, this is your chance to work on that. Uh, Andrea gave you the elements of the pitch. So now you need to go ahead and apply those principles and just, you know, give it a shot. It can't hurt to try. The only way you fail is you don't try. And if you don't want to talk about your pitch, what is one of your greatest opportunities right now for your business? What would you say, like, right now, what is one of the greatest opportunities that I see for my business? Just share that with us. And, and we can see how we can align our services with you to help you to achieve that. Great point, Richard. Fantastic. So who wants to go first? The greatest opportunity you see for your business right now. I see smiling faces, but no takers. I'll go. <laughs> right, there you go. I was expecting you to go. Okay. Um, so I just discovered an untapped market with my business. Uh, well, let me just explain again. My business is Anime Naturals. We do business as CBD Me Please. Um, and I provide um, CBD products. Right now, it is an oversaturated market because, like I said, it's still fairly new. It's a new industry. So everybody wants to sell CBD. Um, my reason for selling CBD is because I suffered from like stress, depression, anxiety, all of that for many, many years. And when I started taking CBD, it helped me a lot. And so um, I discovered an untapped market um, with the airports. I don't want to say what I'm going to do specifically with the airports yet because it's still, you know, kind of sketchy. But I really want to try to put myself out there with the airports and be able to um, do business with them. And so that's why I'm here to try to figure out how to do business with the government and get contracts and that sort of things, um, because they they are really strict with uh, CBD. A lot of a lot of the airports aren't accepting CBD yet, so um, that's why I'm here. I just discovered that untapped market, and I want to kind of tap into it. Fantastic. You. you definitely want to look into federal certifications as well, not just state, but federal. That will help you with that. And you can connect with us and we, can, um, mm -hmm. and we can help you. Just make sure you put your information in the chat. We can help you with that as well to get you connected so you can apply for those federal contracts. So. Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you for sharing that. I'll go next. I think COVID is still um, an advantage for me. I pretty much do international recruiting. That's my specialty with international students. Um, and because they're not traveling here or there's more restrictions, a lot of universities are extending the online courses for them so they could stay in their country and still be accepted to a university, um, but do online classes. And until and then with the Delta variant rising and all of that, I still think that is an advantage for me in that I know how to navigate the visa process, um, helping students with their financial documentation to universities. Um, so that's where I see it's still an advantage for me or I'm turning it into an advantage. All right. Thank you for sharing. Fantastic. Great. Right. Point opportunities, point of opportunities. <laughs> Who wants to go next? I'll go next. Um, <laughs> my name is Carla Hunter. Currently, my you know, I'm working on getting the business going. However, mm -hmm. it's a transportation business, a door-to-door -door, um, transportation service. I currently work in transportation, so I understand the need for um, you know, people being able to get to their doctor appointments, dialysis and, and different things like that. So I'm here just to try to get that, um, that insight on how to get it going and be successful since I'm currently on the other side of it. I see kind of some of the issues and some of the, um, um, the where the communication kind of drops a little bit with trying to get people scheduled um, for those pick up and drop off transportation. Fantastic. And the name of it is and the name of it is help for you transportation. 
All right. Thank you for sharing. Make sure you add your information into the chat. I think Richard, she'd be really good for federal contracting um, opportunities as well. So make sure you look into uh, the Ohio Department of Transportation, not just uh, the state of Ohio certifications. You're exactly right, Andrea. So yes. Mm -hmm. And um, we have a few more minutes left. So we just briefly want to talk about financial statements. And um, it's important for business owners to make sure that they have their financial statements in order, um, especially we have a certification workshop today. So if you're going to need uh, several financial statements, in particular, your balance sheet, uh, your income and profit or profit and loss statement and your cash flow statement. And it seems a lot of times when people hear about those financial statements, it makes them nervous. But it's part of you know being in business. So you need to make sure that you are aware of those statements. You want to make sure those statements are accurate. As um, as our director says, Shoshana Doug, you need to know your numbers. That's so important to know your numbers. It's not enough to just say I'm in business, but you don't know if you're making money, you don't know if you're leaking money, you don't know what you're doing. So you have to know your financial statements. And again, those financial statements are uh, specifically for certification, your balance sheet, uh, your income statement and your cash flow statement. So those are three statements that you're gonna to need to get certified. And um, it's, it's important that um, you have those statements um, up to date and accurate and review them on a regular basis because things change often. So you wanna make sure that you are on top of that with your business. It's a cost of doing business. And if you, if, you, if you don't have someone, I mean, if you're trying to do them yourself, that's one thing you wanna make sure you, you're doing them correctly. If not, you need to, you know, Delegate that out, find you a good accountant or a CPA or somebody to take care of that aspect of your business if you want to be successful in your business. We find a lot of times that, you know, clients stumble in that area. So that's why we're stressing it right now. Uh, we see it often, as Andrea can attest to. Um, you need to have those financial statements in order and, um, and just embrace it as part of, the, part of being a business owner. Would you like to add anything to that, Andrea? Sure, yes. Um, everything you said, very true, very important. Um, I would just like to add that we are here as MBAC uh, certification experts for you to help you grow and scale your business. This is what we do. We help you through four different areas to grow and scale your business, which I will speak about a little later. But it's very important to know the numbers because if you do not know your numbers, you don't know when to scale. And <laughs> so it's very important that um, you get a good accountant that can really help you to, to get to that point to where your business is flowing effectively and efficiently. Jashan, would you like to add anything to that? <laughs> I see you, you, know, you guys made some really good points and uh, you know, I, 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 that's my, I love um, talking about numbers. You know, I really think it's so important as you guys said for businesses to know their numbers. And when I say numbers, I mean, every number, it's important for you not only to know where your business is, what your bottom line looks like, what, what, what your balance sheet and your income statement look like, but also your credit score. You should know what your credit score is. If your credit score is an 850, that's great, but how did it get there? How do you keep it there? If your credit score is a 550, why is it there? What can you do to move it forward? And the same thing with your business. If you're seeing a decline in your revenue, why is that decline there? What can we do to move past that? Or even if your, your business is doing great, how did you get there? what steps and activities got you to that point because that's what's going to keep you thriving so it's important to not only know your numbers but understand your numbers going in and out your business any number that has to do with you or your business you should be able to articulate why why is what it is and what you can do to either keep it there or improve it great points fantastic april how are we looking right now We are doing good, Andrea. Uh, just a couple more minutes and we'll be ready to get started. Fantastic. So any last, we have about four minutes left. Does anyone want to do that last minute pitch? Would you like to get that in? Any takers for that? We got about four more minutes and we're gonna get started. This is a great opportunity for you to explain to everyone on the call share your business, what you do, what you provide. Oh wait, I have a, there's a. Mm, 
Cheryl, what was the question? What, what do you mean by Chamber of Commerce? Um, I've heard that you can make a connection, I believe, with uh, your city's Chamber of Commerce, mm -hmm. but I don't really know what they can do to help me. Is it just the networking opportunity? What do they actually do to help us as business owners? Sure. Okay. Mm -hmm. Go ahead, Shoshana. Um, it's really important. Um, if you're in Cleveland Heights, University Heights, Cleveland, Euclid, it doesn't matter what city you, you're in. If you are operating a business, it's very important for you to reach out to the municipality. Um, first, start with the Department of Economic Development. Um, if they don't have economic development, community development, the reason being is because there are so many different programs out there that you don't know about unless you're connected. Mm -hmm. You know, especially being an entrepreneur, you know, get, entrepreneurship is a lonely road and you don't have to go at it alone. And when you don't reach out to your different partners, your different organizations and the resources that are available for you, you travel that load, that road alone. And it, it, I know economic development has a lot of different funding opportunities, grant opportunities, even when COVID happened. I know businesses, specifically in Cleveland Heights, who received emails from the Department of Economic Development for some, some funding relief programs that they have, for some relief programs that they have for entrepreneurs. But if you're not connected, you don't get that information. And then also they do have opportunities for you to get loans from them, low interest loans to grow your business or sustain your business as well. Also, with that being said, when it comes to your chamber within your city, if your city has a chamber, become active, become involved, mm -hmm. because yes, it is a great resource for you, but it's also a great opportunity for you to connect and um, touch on all the different other, the other businesses within the city. They also have different programs and resources available. You know what's going on in the city when it comes up. Um, events, they'll consider you for first. Um, being able to be connected is one of the most important things that you can do for your business because again, that's free marketing. Absolutely great. Thank you for that, Shoshana. Yeah, because some economic, like I work with Lorraine Huron at Erie. Huron does not have an economic development department, but they do have a chamber of commerce. So that chamber of commerce works with the businesses to make sure within that county to make sure they have what they need. So you definitely want to reach out to any chambers of commerce, the economic development department, the city as a whole, just to see exactly what they have that can help you scale your business. Thank you so much. I appreciate that. Absolutely. And I think it is 10 o'clock. Shoshana, would you like to kick us off? Sure. Thank you very much for that, Andrea. Thank you, mm -hmm. you amazing and back team. Um, I am Shoshana Duckworth. I'm Regional Director for the Minority Business Assistance Center. I want to first welcome you all in taking that initial step to get your business certified and to learn more about the opportunities with Future Heights. Um, so for those of you who are not familiar with the Entrepreneurship Center, what the Entrepreneurship Center at Urban League is, it consists of three different areas, okay? So at the Entrepreneurship Center, we have what's called our SB. specific for our businesses and it's a great opportunity for our businesses to receive capital to grow their businesses it's not for businesses looking to sustain through covid but it's for our businesses who were able to thrive and are looking to maybe get a second location maybe they're looking to um, acquire working capital or increase their inventory we have this program available for them not only is this program available only for our clients but it carries a low six percent interest rate OK, and it is not a program that you walk in the door, you apply for and we turn you down because if there for any reason, if you are not ready for that lending program, we get you ready. We go through the process of reviewing your credentials and making sure that you're ready for that loan product and getting you to that point if you're not ready when you first apply. 
The last area which we represent is our Minority Business Assistance Center. Our Minority Business Assistance Center is similar to our Small Business Assistance Center in a way, but what we do is we deal more with established businesses, and we're there to assist with contract procurement, certifications, and access to capital. And I'm going to give it over to our amazing business advisor, Andrea, and she's going to talk to you a little bit more about who MBAC is and what we do. Fantastic. Thank you, Shoshana. Good morning. Welcome to the pre-certification workshop, How to Do Business with Cleveland Heights and University Heights. My name is Andrea Boyd. I am a business advisor here at the Minority Business Assistance Center at the Urban League of Greater Cleveland. I am joined this morning by my colleagues, business advisor Richard Brown, our program coordinator, April Needham, and our director, Shoshana Duckworth. At this pre-certification lab, our presenters will provide an overview that includes introductory steps and tips to ensure you go through the certification process successfully. We have two types of certification workshops each month. At the beginning of the month, we have a one-day pre-certification workshop. And at the end of each month, we have a three-day certification lab series. Today, our pre-certification workshop is co-hosted by Future Heights and the state of Ohio. So today you will hear about how to do business with Cleveland Heights and University Heights. And they will speak with you about some of the resources that they offer to support women, minority and veteran owned small businesses in Ohio. You will also hear uh, from some small business enterprises who will share some insight about why they chose to become certified and how they have grown or scaled their business. This section of our workshop is moderated by our fantastic Mr. Richard Brown. <laughs> so what is MBAC? MBAC identifies emerging minority-owned businesses and we cultivate their growth and sustainability. Our overarching goal here at MBAC is to help you guys, business owners just like you, contribute to job creation in Ohio. How do we do this? We do this by focusing on four key areas of growth we call our four pillars. This is through certification, contracts and procurement opportunities, access to capital and technical and professional assistance. So if you need assistance with accounting, if you need assistance with business plans, if you need a assistance with capability statements to be able to bid on those contract opportunities that you mo most definitely want to get, you want to make sure you reach out to us. Our information will be in the chat provided below. And at this time, I will hand it back over to our program coordinator, April Needham. April, you have the floor. Great. Thank you so much, Andrea. Good morning again, everyone, and thank you so much for being here. I'm just going to go over a few housekeeping tips before we continue on. Um, if you could please make sure that your microphone is on mute uh, when someone else is speaking, we would really appreciate that. And also we are using our chat box option on the right hand side to ask any questions and to put your contact information in the chat box. Um, and if you're not sure how to use that option, if you click on more at the bottom of your screen, there is a chat box option that will pull up and you just click on that and it'll pop right up for you. Also, I will be emailing everyone when our workshop is over today with all of our presenters contact information, as well as a link to our YouTube page where you can view a recording of today's workshop. With that being said, are there any questions before we get started? All right, perfect. Then without further ado, I would like to introduce our speakers for today. We have Deanna Brummer Fisher. She's the Executive Director of the Future Heights Community Development Corporation and Brian Anderson, the Business Development Manager of the City of Cleveland Heights. Welcome. Thank you, April. It's great to be here. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. There's Brian, good to see you. We're delighted to welcome you all here today. And April's gonna queue up my presentation just to tell you a little bit about Future Heights. Uh, as April said, we are the Community Development Corporation for Cleveland Heights and University Heights, uh, two inner ring suburbs of Cleveland. And we have been around since 2002 uh, as a 
uh, an organization that that started out as, as a grassroots organization representing residents of, of, of Cleveland Heights initially, and later we expanded to uh, the city of University Heights as well. Um, I've got a brief video that I'd like April to share as we start uh, to give you a brief introduction of Future Heights and some of the programs that we have. say that Future Heights is the connector for residents and resources and organizations, agencies, and Cleveland Heights. April, you need to switch to a different screen, probably. Yeah, I think you do. We're, we're not seeing the video, April. Sorry about that. Let's, re let's, re let's fix that for you. There we go. Can everyone see the video now? No. Yep, okay, perfect. I would say that Future Heights is the connector for residents and resources and organizations, agencies, and Cleveland Heights. The program that I really love the best of the heights contents. I think it really gives a way for businesses to highlight what they do, interact with the community, and also get some feedback from them. We're going to work such as developing stress models, not just to fix the outside of a home, but to make it so that it's. in future heights grants. My grant was for a play yard so that the kids from both the synagogue and the community can play there together. The Heights Observer is the mouthpiece for the community. And so it's a place for dialogue. It's a place for diverse views to come out. This is an important place to get information about what's happening. Cleveland Heights has many artists and musicians, which makes it a wonderful community. Heights Music Hut that we have every year in the fall. Um, it's a great way to get residents and non-residents alike together to enjoy music all up and down the street. I would say that Future Heights is the connector oh for residents and resources and organizations and agencies in Cleveland Heights. I don't see a video. I'm sorry, everyone. You saw the video, correct? No. April, I think what's happening when you show your screen is if the video is on side of the presentation, you're going to have to exit off that screen and then go back to that screen. So it may be hard for you to share that, the, share the video if it's inside of the presentation. Uh, April, if you want to enable me to share, I could share it directly, perhaps. Yeah, that how about help. we do that? I'm yeah. sorry about the technical difficulties. Yeah, let, let's do that. Okay, Deanna, you should be able to share now. I would say that Future Heights is the connector for residents and resources and organizations, agencies in Cleveland Heights. The 
program that I really admire at Future Heights is the Best of the Heights contest. I think it really gives a way for businesses to highlight what they do, interact with the community, and also get some feedback from the community. We're doing work such as uh, redeveloping distressed homes, and not just to fix the outside of a home, but to make it so that it's livable. I was able to get a Future Heights grant. So my grant was for a play yard so that the kids from both the synagogue and the community can play there together. The Heights Observer yeah. is the I don't think the video page has been so shared. What's been shared is the actual screen to pull out. This is an important place to get information about what's happening. And Deanna, look, it seems like we're looking at your, your documents folder. Ah, okay. It's music hop that we have every year in the fall. Um, it's a great way to get residents and non-residents alike together to enjoy music all up and down. If you the drag the video on that screen, we should be able to see it. All right, well, <laughs> let's see. We can try that again. Maybe we'll try one more time and then, <laughs> sorry about that guys. I would say that Future Heights is we go, we got it. residents <laughs> and resources and organizations, agencies in Cleveland Heights. The program that I really admire at Future Heights is the Best of the Heights contest. I think it really gives a way for businesses to highlight what they do, interact with the community, and also get some feedback from the community. We're doing work such as uh, redeveloping distressed homes, and not just to fix the outside of a home, but to make it so that it's livable. I was able to get a Future Heights grant. So my grant was for a play yard so that the kids from both the synagogue and the community can play there together. The Heights Observer is the mouthpiece for the community. And so it's a place for dialogue, it's a place for diverse views to come out. This is an important place to get information about what's happening. Cleveland Heights has many artists and musicians, which makes it a wonderful community. Heights Music Hop that we have every year in the fall. Um, it's a great way to get residents and non-residents alike together to enjoy music all up and down the street. All right, third time was a charm. <laughs> there we go. I know it's always something new with these, uh, the Zoom and technology and everything. Thank you so much, Deanna, for getting that to work for us. And thank you everyone for being patient as we deal with uh, technical difficulties this morning. Yeah, I think- I am, Go ahead, Deanna. It's something we've all learned how to do over the last 15 months or so, right? <laughs> yes, absolutely. So let me just share my screen one more time and let's get this PowerPoint presentation up here. All right. Here we are, Deanna. Are you ready to continue? And so I'm going to talk just very briefly about some have specifically for our local businesses. Uh, Cleveland Heights and University Heights are very proud of the fact that we have so many local, locally owned businesses. And every year we seek to recognize those businesses in a variety of different categories with our Best of the Heights Awards. Uh, we have done this for more than 10 years. 
And every year we change up the categories. Last year, we had some very specific categories to recognize some of the heroic efforts that our local businesses uh, took to deal with COVID. Um, things like best curbside pickup, um, best online ordering, uh, best um, uh, COVID pivot, uh, were some of the uh, categories that we had last year. And we ask residents to vote for their favorite businesses in these categories um, at beginning January 1st and going through February 15th. So there's about a six week period when Heights residents are encouraged to vote for their local businesses. And we encourage our local businesses to talk to their customers about that and encourage them to vote for them. Um, it's always a write-in ballot so we've got the different categories and your customers need to think of you and write you in um, to the voting. And we get hundreds of voters every year. We then announce the award winners in our April print issue of the Heights Observer. You can see some of the photographs of some of the winners uh, in the past. And in 2021, uh, we tried something uh, a little bit different in that we gave an, an, an additional incentive for people to vote. Every unique voter received a chance to win a gift certificate package of gift certificates from local businesses. So Future Heights purchased gift certificates from various local businesses, put them into four packages. Uh, each were, were worth several hundred dollars and four lucky winners uh, were chosen from among those who voted uh, in the Best of the Heights Awards. So it's a great opportunity to get some recognition for your business. Next slide, please. And so let me talk a little bit about the Heights Observer. The Heights Observer has been in existence now for more than 10 years as well. Uh, this is our local community newspaper. Future Heights publishes it. It's a little bit different from many of the other local newspapers in that we have no paid writing staff. So we rely on members of the community to submit articles for the Observer and we cover local news, we cover local events and we cover local businesses. Uh, so if your business has some news, if you're new to the area, if you've expanded, if you've um, expanded your product line, have any news that you would like to get out to the Heights community, the Heights Observer is a good free resource for you. Uh, because you can have someone submit an article about your business. Uh, we generally discourage business owners from writing articles about themselves. It's a little awkward uh, if you're quoting yourself in an article. Uh, however, we have lots of, of dedicated customers who write about the local businesses that they patronize and we welcome and encourage that. Uh, it is an award-winning newspaper uh, for the last three years. We have won the Ohio Excellence in Journalism Award for Best Non-Daily um, Publication in Ohio. And so we're very proud of that. Uh, 2020 and 2021 have been difficult for us as they have been for lots of local businesses. Um, this publication relies on advertising revenues from our local businesses. So when you're hurting, uh, we are as well. And uh, we maintain very low advertising rates for our local businesses to make it easy for you to, to reach your customers. And we offer both classified ads in a special classified ad section uh, that are very inexpensive, as well as display ads uh, that you will also find are very inexpensive comparatively to other publications um, in the region. And we also rely on our local businesses for distribution. Um, so when the shutdown happened and everything was closed, uh, we got very creative in terms of how to get our publication out to the public. It's a free publication. It's usually available in many locations throughout the Heights. So many of our local businesses um, carry the Observer. And if you've got a storefront and you would like to have copies of the Observer, just let me know. We'd be delighted to add you to our distribution list. Um, you also may know that there are several free libraries that are located throughout the city in neighborhoods, uh, business district. And so we also have agreements with those, um, those owners to uh, distribute the Heights Observer through that as well. Um, so it's been challenging. It's been a challenging year, um, but as more businesses are opening up 
and um, there are there's more news, more local events that are happening. Uh, we're seeing that our page can. In April. Thank you. In the video, you noticed that we also have a housing program. Uh, Future Heights is partnering with the City of Cleveland Heights and the Cuyahoga County Land Bank to obtain vacant and abandoned properties throughout our neighborhoods in Cleveland Heights and restore them to their past glory, as well as bring them up to the future. Uh, here is just one example, actually two examples of homes that we have completed in the last 15 months. Uh, these are homes, uh, both of these homes are located in the neighborhood that is near our high school. Uh, and as you can see, they were quite distressed before. Um, once they come into our program, they are completely renovated from top to bottom with all new systems uh, air conditioning, heating systems, roofing, windows if needed, uh, flooring, paint surfaces, new appliances, and in many cases we're also adding features such as powder rooms or expanding the living space by um, creating an owner suite either in the basement or in the on the third floor. Um, so this has been a very successful program for us. We've completed over 11 houses um, in the uh, 24 months that the program has been in operation. May I have the next slide, please? So I just want to very briefly tell you about some of the programs that we have that are coming up. Future Heights offers a number of public forums and workshops throughout the year. And sometimes these workshops are tailored directly for business owners. Um, you may be familiar with the fact that there is a development project that is proposed for the Cedar Lee Meadowbrook area. Um, and the city is partnering with uh, its development partners to have a couple of open houses and workshops uh, regarding that development to get some public input. So we've got an event coming up on August 5th that is going to deal with parking and traffic. And then another one on August 11th uh, that is going to be dealing with the public spaces and connectivity uh, of the development uh, in the district. In addition to that, Future Heights has a discussion for small business owners that is going to happen via Zoom on August 9th. So we're inviting all of our small business owners in the Heights to join us for a discussion about how COVID has affected you, about um, special improvement districts and uh, certification, uh, any other topics that are important to you. Uh, particularly this year as Cleveland Heights celebrates its centennial and also gets ready to elect, directly elect a mayor for the very first time. Um, so we wanna hear from business owners and hear about the issues that are important to you. What we are hoping is that we will be able to um, break people up into discussion groups by the neighborhood in which their business is located so that you can talk with your peers about things that are very local to you, uh, issues that may you may have in your district, ideas that you may have in your district and be able to network with your neighbors. Next slide, please. So I mentioned the upcoming election uh, and this is very important, something that Future Heights is uh, very involved in. We've partnered with the League of Women Voters, which is a nonpartisan um, nonprofit that supports education about uh, elections. And for many years now, we have hosted candidates forums with the League of Women Voters. We are doing so again this year. You can see the dates there. Next week, we've got a primary election coming up for the Cleveland Heights mayor. There are four candidates who are running. Um, so if you've not had a chance to meet them yet, that's a great opportunity to meet them in person, hear from them and ask questions. And then later on, as you can see, we will have other candidates forums on for the, the council races and the school board races. Next slide, please. And then also, I just wanted to let you know about some of the other Future Heights events that are coming up soon. Future Heights has an annual benefit 
Uh, we were not able to host it last year in 2020, uh, but this year we are hosting it in a beautiful house on Fairmount Boulevard and Stratford. Uh, and we are also honoring Susie Kayser, um, who's been very involved in, in lots of uh, organizations in the Heights for many years. But most recently, she has authored a book uh, called Resisting Segregation, and it tells our history in Cleveland Heights of and all of the organizations and, and the people who've been involved in that struggle. Um, so uh, we're very pleased to honor her uh, this year at our upcoming benefit. We've also got a neighborhood leadership workshop series. Um, this is a series of workshops for neighborhood leaders. So if you are a resident of Cleveland Heights and you'd like to get more involved in your neighborhood, attending the workshop series and that deadline is coming up on August 31st. Uh, we also have a mini grants program uh, and this program offers up to $1,000 for a neighborhood based project. We have funded uh, more than 35 projects throughout the city of Cleveland Heights during the four or five years that this program has been in existence. Everything from um, community gardens to neighborhood events um, and it is uh, oftentimes a good amount of funds to be able to leverage with other funds. Uh, and we've been able to do public art, community events, as I've said, um, and all of these are initiatives that have happened in neighborhoods. And sometimes they, uh, residents do need to partner with businesses. So it might also be a great opportunity for you to connect with neighbors uh, if there is a particular mini grant project uh, that's happening in your neighborhood. And then lastly, I'm very excited that we are able to bring Heights Music Hop back again this year. We were not able to host it last year at all because of the pandemic. Um, this year we're back uh, on September 18th, one night only in the Cedarley Business District on three outdoor stages. We've got a variety of music, um, everything from jazz, classical, um, R&B, um, soul, uh, Americana, rock, uh, lots of different genres that showcase the diversity of our community, all local music, all local artists. Um, and we're very excited to be able to host it again this year. Next slide, please. So lastly, I just wanted to make sure that you have my contact information. Um, we at Future Heights are uh, very interested in getting to know our business community. Uh, also on the call today, and I'll introduce her in just a moment, is Sruthi Baz, our deputy director. Um, she is going to be heading up an outreach program um, for local businesses here in Cleveland Heights. And so I'm very eager for you to meet her. Uh, in addition, I wanted to provide the contact information for, for our two partner cities, City of Cleveland Heights, Brian Anderson is here today and he's going to be speaking with you in just a moment. And then Susan Drucker, who is the Economic Development Director for the City of University Heights. Uh, they were not able to be here today, uh, but I'd like wanted to uh, provide you with her contact information as well. Um, so that's all I've got for you today. I am more than happy to answer any questions. Um, so April, if you want to get us back to the screen here. Um, Everyone, I'd, I'd like to very briefly introduce Sruthi Baz, our deputy director, who I mentioned. Sruthi, if you'd like to say a few words of hello. Hi, everyone. Thank you, Deanna. Um, hi, everyone. It's nice to meet you. Um, as Deanna mentioned, I'll be um, starting to work with small um, and local businesses in Cleveland Heights, and I'm eager to learn from you and what, um, what some of your support and ideas are and what your needs are. Um, so feel free to reach out. I will put my name and email in the chat. Um, so feel free to reach out anytime, and I look forward to meeting you. Thank you, Sruthi. So if, if anyone has any questions, I'd be happy to answer them. And if not, then we'll go on to our next speaker. So 
So good good morning. Is that is that me, Deanna? Yes, Brian, you are our next speaker. Okay. All right. Very good. Um, let me see if I am able to share my screen here. Can can you everyone see the uh, the presentation there? Yep, you have it on. Okay, good. Well, that's a that's a good start. Um, <laughs> well, hold on a second here. Let's see if I can get this into full screen. If not, we will make do with what we have here. There we go. Not quite. Here we go. This might work. There we go. Fantastic. My name is Brian Anderson. I am the business development manager in the economic development department for the city of Cleveland Heights. Um, you know, listening in on the beginning there, uh, you know, some really um, good comments that I would have started on, started off with here as well. That um, whether you're working in Cleveland Heights or University Heights or or any city, it's always a good idea to reach out to um, the economic development department uh, if they have one, um, whether you're an existing business considering some changes or expansions or uh, a new location or a new business, it's always good to touch base with them. Um, generally, you know, we're here as kind of a uh, catch all to be of assistance to businesses and the business community, answer questions, you know, solve problems as best we can. Uh, you know, for you. If you happen to be in a city that doesn't have a specific economic development um, person or office, uh, there's always, uh, oftentimes within either community development or planning, uh, the planning department, they can also help you um, with whatever questions you might need and help you to get connected to the right, the right folks. Same here. So I did want to start off, you know, I get the sense that there's a, a kind of a variety of businesses or entrepreneurs on this call here today. Um, this was something new that I added as you're kind of starting out either with a first location or a new location. Um, you know, the business plan is going to be a big part of it. I love that part of the conversation earlier, understanding your financials and your financial position, both as a business and also personally is going to be important, um, you know, for you. Uh, but just a couple of quick comments and things to think about um, that I've sort of learned and watched over my years of experience, both in Cleveland Heights and elsewhere, is when a business is looking for um, a brick and mortar space, um, really taking the time to make sure you do it right and your interests um, are protected. Um, you know, obviously, uh, you know, you can, uh, once you go out and start to look at a variety of spaces and understanding what kind of space you might be looking for that might work for you, you get into a, a lease negotiation um, uh, conversation and really take your time on that. If you are able to, it's great to have uh, a commercial real estate person representing you and or a lawyer to look over documents uh, to make sure that you're really protected. Um, on that front. My general first comment is always do not rush into signing a lease. I've unfortunately seen too many times, um, you know, a small business person or entrepreneur kind of get pressured or feel they need to secure a property before they're ready. Give yourself some time for, for due diligence um, to make sure that the space is going to work for you, understanding the lease, understanding, we'll get into this more, the zoning and the building code and all the other things that go into it. And also understanding some of the terms in the fine print is your lease a gross versus net. Um, if you're a triple net lease, your actual out of pocket is going to be a lot higher than the, the price they're quoting per square foot or per month up front. Uh, who's responsible for what in your building or space if you're leasing as far as tenant improvements and maintenance. Um, so really take your time and, and really get comfortable with that. Um, you know, there are some options, you know, if you kind of want to get some time, but give some assurances to your uh, potential 
landlord, you know, ask for a, a, a potential letter of intent that gives you 30, 60 days to explore some of these types of options. So, uh, and some of those things that you would need to explore under due diligence is zoning. Um, you know, an economic development department can help answer those questions. So zoning is gonna be based very specifically on your type of use and your type of business. Different cities have different zoning um, uses that are allowed in different districts. Um, some, so there's what's called being permitted by right. And then there's oftentimes what's called conditional use permits. So some examples of conditional use permits um, in a city like Cleveland Heights is going to be anything that's animal related, daycares, things like that, where it's oftentimes allowed, but you need to file an application and, and maybe get approved by the planning commission before you'd be allowed uh, to be open. Um, also along those lines, before you move forward with the lease and while you're considering a lease or a space, you need to think about the zoning, or excuse me, the building code. You may be allowed by zoning to open up a business in a location, but it may turn out once you've signed the lease that yes, you can open your business there, but you're gonna be required to put in sprinklers or if you're a restaurant, a hood uh, and fire suppression and all things that you may not have built into your business plan um, and your budget going into it. So working, you, you may need to work with a, uh, an architect or a design professional to understand your use per the building code and what other costs may be built in there. And then finally, uh, permits and licenses. Again, licenses will be specific to um, whatever type of business you have. Um, you know, I'm not an expert on all of those, but generally you'll be the expert and, and as opposed to myself, but for Cleveland Heights and for a lot of cities, there are gonna be uh, a general kind of business operation permit where you have to be registered. We do a quick inspection to make sure the space is up to code and safe. Um, so those are all things to think about before you start to jump into, um, you know, a location, whether it's your first one, a second one, whatever the case may, may be. Um, you know, and obviously all of the, you know, business plan and, you know, uh, marketing and financial planning that, you know, um, different centers, the SBDCs, you know, are able to offer are all great and a big part um, of that process as well. So I wanted to talk a little bit then about uh, some of our programs that we offer here uh, in Cleveland Heights. Over the years, we've really built out a pretty strong, what we call our uh, business development toolkit. Um, you know, there are a variety of loans and some grant programs built in. Um, we'll talk a little bit about each of these just very briefly. Ultimately, my overarching mes messages for all of you is if you have a question or you, you know, either about in general, your, you know, your business is it pertains to Cleveland Heights or whatever city you may be in, uh, pick up the phone, give us a call. Um, Deanna posted my information once. I'm going to have it here again at the end and I'll put it in the chat. Um, so, you know, you don't need to understand all of these programs that I'm going to lay out here. Uh, but if you do want to kind of explore some opportunities here, uh, the best the best way to go about that is, is, you know, for us to have a conversation and we'll kind of figure out which program or programs might be a good fit for you. Uh, our commercial revolving loan fund. Um, what that does is it provides uh, gap financing, typically in conjunction with a bank or other financial institution loan. We do generally offer what would be below market interest rates for what you'd probably be able to get from the from the bank portion of your loan. So I just kind of listed it out. The typical structure on something like this is if a bank's doing 50% of the loan, uh, the city would do somewhere in the neighborhood of 35% and 15% owner contribution. So a good example, you know, for this type of loan that we did was uh, Boss Dog Brewing there on Lee Road, where we helped finance uh, a portion of their brewing equipment when they opened. Our storefront renovation program, um, and actually I, I forgot to update this. So um, this, this program helps transform and rehabilitate commercial uh, buildings throughout the city. And um, you know, if you're a tenant, this may not be a great fit for you, but I wanted to put it out there on the table because generally it involves participation from the property owner as well, since we'd be helping to invest in real estate and that's ultimately their asset that they'll retain ownership of long-term. 
but this is a great program. Um, you know, if your landlord is interested in your that property or in need to make some improvements, or if you're in a position where you're looking to acquire your own your own commercial real estate uh, to make some improvements uh, in your uh, in your business. So the program actually now offers rebates up to forty thousand um, dollars at a fifty percent cost share, and then uh, we're able to go up to a hundred thousand dollars in interest uh, free loans as well. Again, since this involves real estate and oftentimes a property owner, it's a little bit more complex than some of our other um, programs, but it is worth the conversation depending on your exact situation. Um, a really good program, I think, which may be um, a good vehicle for a lot of you on the, on the call here today is our SBA Small Business Grant. This program provides a grant in the form of, of a forgivable loan up to 15% of a project with a maximum of $50,000. So what this does, it, it serves as an additional equity in, infusion to assist businesses in qualifying for an SBA loan. It minimizes or reduces the risk to the SBA lenders. So it makes them a little bit easier to potentially approve you for an SBA loan and oftentimes with better terms. So uh, a typical deal structure here is, you know, for whatever your, the project here may be defined as, 75% of it would be the SBA loan through an SBA lender. 15% um, would be our grant contribution and then 10% owner equity. So essentially what this shows then with our grant and the owner equity, it's showing in the financials as a 25% equity stake for this deal, which is a much stronger position than 10% by itself for the SBA uh, lender to approve the deal. Um, and it also helps preserve kind of the working capital side of things and cash flow for the owner if they only have to contribute the 10% versus a 20 or a 25 up front. Uh, a good example of this is Blank Canvas CLE, which is a art gallery there uh, on Lee Road and Michael Newman, he's been uh, great to work with. Uh, our economic development uh, loan fund, it's kind of similar to the commercial um, loan fund. Uh, the commercial loan fund is HUD funded. So sometimes there's some requirements and different strings and documentation required that is sometimes a challenge. Um, so this kind of fills a similar type of role to be able to assist with projects um, that may not as easily fit into some of our, uh, some of our other buckets. We do have a, a micro loan, a micro enterprise loan program. This is a, a loan up to ten thousand um, dollars. This is definitely for more the you know either startup or a very new business, smaller businesses. Um, it's businesses with five employees of less uh, or less, one of which is the uh, owner. Uh, it can be used for a, a wide variety of things. Uh, the program does require having a business plan reviewed by by an SBDC, so obviously, you know, we talked about the importance um, of that earlier as well. So again, um, you know, whether it's this program or any of our programs, please, uh, you know, feel free to reach out to me. Uh, again, there's my contact information uh, for our existing business um, uh, businesses on the, you know, call here today. Um, we have, you know, during COVID tried to put out uh, information uh, regarding programs that may be available to some of our businesses. And uh, I was happy to hear earlier in the conversation that some of you are, are getting those emails and seeing those emails. And uh, we were we did do a small grant program um, during COVID, uh, but you know a lot of, you know, in larger amounts, um, what was available was through SBA and the Payroll Protection Program and through the state of Ohio and through Cuyahoga County. We tried to keep our business community apprised of all those types of opportunities. Um, as well, as well as looking at um, seeing what additional programming, whether it's COVID related or not, or maybe kind of COVID recovery focused for some of our commercial districts. We're, we're, we're looking at some additional options, but um, we're, we're definitely here as a resource and whether it's um, looking at some of our financial programs or something more specific about city services or something going on with your business, you know, please feel free to, to reach out to myself um, and let us know if you have any questions or anything you want to talk about. So um, I guess that's it in a nutshell. I'm happy to answer um, any questions. Thank you so much, Brian. Do we have any questions for Brian Anderson today?
Brian, I have a question. Uh, um, what, can you explain a triple net for us? Yeah, sure. Um, so a triple net, um, so okay, gross, let's, let's start with gross and we'll work our way backwards. So with a gross type of lease, you're, you know, whatever it says you're paying per month is what you're paying per month. Everything else is sort of, you know, built into it. So when you get into a triple net, so you have your lease rate that you're paying for your space per month, but then there's going to be add-ons to it. And that's, you're going to get into, you know, not only you're responsible for your lease, you're going to be responsible for utilities. Or you're going to be responsible for your por por portion of the insurance on the property. You're going to be responsible for your portion of the property taxes on the property. So if you, on paper, you may, you know, your lease rate may say you're paying $10 a square foot annually. But when you calculate in the nets, you know, when what is it? like we described a triple net, that $10 per square foot might actually be closer to $15 or more per square foot. So it could be, uh, you know, 25 to 50% higher than what the on paper lease rate is. So that's sometimes, you know, without really reading the fine print on your lease is, is a real cost increase you might not have factored in. But thank you, because I recently had a client and they, they signed a lease with triple net. So I cringed when they said that. So that's why I wanted to, you know, you share that with people because when they say triple net, I'm like, oh, so you're paying taxes, insurance, and all those other different things. So you really want to be careful before yep. you sign the leases. So thank you. Awesome. Any more questions for Brian? We got two participants raise their hand, looks like. There we go. We have uh Miss India Hobbs, would you like to ask your question? You're on mute. There we are. <laughs> there you are. <laughs> uh, yes, I currently have a home care company. So uh, right now, really tough, I'm looking to find a new location. Um, and I was wondering what type of programs do Cleveland Heights have that connects uh, to senior citizens, which is primarily my customer base. Okay, so um, I would I would probably recommend, as far as that goes, is probably connecting through our community center, which also has uh, the senior center component to it. Um, so I would recommend reaching out um, to, uh, like I said, to the community center and Joe McRae, our um, recreation director who who manages that side of it. Um, I know they have a you know obviously COVID's been a challenge obviously for for them as well on on, on you know, it has been for everybody but certainly on a, you know managing a community center and, and you know that has a senior center there's you know that's certainly impacted them but you know for specifically if you're looking to connect with more of a senior market uh, you know here in a Cleveland Heights uh, that would probably be the best uh, avenue to do that so. Um, if, you, if you saw, if you have my contact information, you can shoot me a note and I can connect you with the right folks over at the Senior Center. Okay, thank you so much. I appreciate it. Thank you. I see your hand up, Ms. Sherrill. Would you like to ask your question? Yes. Um, can you walk us through the process of having the business plan evaluated? So is that is that geared towards? So I, I guess from from the city's perspective, you know, hopefully we're you know you know either from your own experience or working with an SBDC or other uh, you know technical assistance providers, you know, you're able to get to a pretty strong um, you know business plan. Uh, you know, we will we're in you know, review it internally staff wise, ask, you know, questions to make sure the, the financials kind of quote unquote make sense to us, not that we're an expert certainly on everything. Um, and I guess, you know, beyond that, it's kind of a question of what program or programs we may be looking at or considering utilizing for you, you know, as part of our, uh, you know, review process. If we're looking at a, a loan or other type of grant opportunity, typically we will um, try to work with some commercial bankers to have them review the uh, the pro formas and the financials and the business plan to get some feedback from them. Um, you know, we're certainly a little bit more um, lenient and less strict in, in terms of our underwriting and review of 
financials and business plans, but uh, we do work uh, uh, some with, uh, you know, some of our uh, commercial bankers that we work with to, to give us some feedback as well. But, um, you know, it's just really, um, you know, understanding, um, you know, the, in terms of the business plan, understanding that you've identified a market and really understand the industry um, and really have, you know, hopefully what is a really realistic, you know, budget. You know, I guess one thing that I've certainly seen over the years is that, um, you know, the new businesses tend to overestimate revenue on the front end and underestimate expenses. Um, so, you know, really, you know, kind of thinking about that and, um, you know, building in contingencies on both the, uh, you know, the revenue side really being um, conservative on what's going to be coming in the door and building in, you know, you know, anywhere from a 10 to 25% contingency on your, you know, expenses. Um, but beyond that, you know, on the business plan side, you know, wanting to understand, um, you know, your, you know, expertise in an industry or research you may have done, if this is a new endeavor for you, um, and making sure you kind of, you understand, um, you know, have a good grasp on, you know, the, the industry and the market, and as well as, you know, I've also seen um, another, you know, kind of comment, general comment is there are so many great, passionate entrepreneurs and businesses out there, and they are so focused on getting their business open that, um, you know, they're not uh, focusing as much on the, on the marketing and communication side. So they may have a great product and a great business, but no one knows about them. No one can find them online, um, things like that. So it's really not just understanding um, you know, your business and what it is you do, but how are you going to bring in customers through the door? So that's a kind of a long answer. Uh, no. but, uh, you know, we're really kind of looking at the whole thing, you know, you know, comprehensively. And, uh, if that's a new endeavor for you, I certainly do encourage you working with, you know, an SBDC partner or other technical assistance provider. They'll give you a lot of really great guidance and, and things to think about, um, as you're, you know, working to develop that. Okay. And is that, in, is that in the uh, office there, the SBCD person? So I was going to comment on that, actually, Brian, mm -hmm. you know, that was a great um, explanation on what is needed in a business plan. I just want to comment from a technical assistance standpoint. Um, first and foremost, our, we do have a small business development center inside of the Entrepreneurship Center at Urban League. We work closely with Cleveland Heights University, Heights City of Cleveland, Euclid, all of the cities, especially when it comes to one of the programs that Brian mentioned was the SBA Muni program. And he specifically mentioned that your business plan has to get vetted by a SBDC. And when we talk about vetting a business plan, when we talk about what the different municipalities and even lenders are looking for in this business plan, what they're looking for is to see how you told your story, right? Your business plan should be your book, putting it in front of the investor, putting it in front of the municipality, putting it, putting it in front of the bank saying, this is why you should invest in me, because this is what I will do, and this is what I am doing, and this is how I'm going to grow. This is why you should invest in me. And then it also, again, I go back to what I mentioned about knowing your numbers. When you sit down, you should be able to explain what's inside of that business plan, what your numbers are and how you got to them. Brian made a good point of how, about how a lot of new businesses in the, overestimate their revenue and underestimate their expenses. So when you sit down, you need to be able to explain where your forecast came from. So, hey, you know, this is my revenue and I'm growing it by 10% by next year because I'm going to do these marketing efforts. You need to be able to explain that. And that's what they're looking for in that business plan. The good thing is our SBDC is there to assist you with not only developing that information. So as I stated before, they can do GIS reporting. They can do analytical research. They have a team of analysts sitting on the back end to just do industry research, um, market analysis, whatever it is that you need. And they also have a technical writer right now who is assisting with writing full comprehensive business plans. 
Our MBAC team is also available and here to assist with putting together business plans. It's just that our SBDC has more resources available at, at Urban League. So you can come to us we can start the process with you of if you have a business plan, we can review it, we can help you strengthen your business plan. And then we also can connect you with our small business development center who have more resources available to really do that back end work for you to assist you with getting that research and that analytical data, data that you need and even have um, some really nice tools to help you with, help you with formulating your projections. And you're on mute. And that is it. Um, Brian, if you don't have anything else, we'll give it back over to April. And again, you guys, please reach out, especially when it comes to business plans um, to us or either our Small Business Development Center, and we can assist you with that process, making sure that it's comprehensive and that you have the information that you need in it and you also understand it. Great. Thank you so much, Ashana. Thank you so much, Brian, uh, for being here today. Thank you so much for that wonderful information. And if anyone else has any other questions uh, for Brian, uh, you'll have his contact information in the follow-up email. So I am going to move on to our next portion of the workshop today. We are running a little bit behind. Um, we are going to move on to our business panelist discussion. We have some great entrepreneurs on the call with us today. And I'm going to hand it over to our business advisor, Richard Brown. Thank you, April. And I just want to welcome our panelists today. We have for our panelists, we have Mariko Lewis and we have Sarah Bartlett. And I'm so thankful that both of them agreed to participate in our panelist discussion. So uh, first of all, I'm going to allow them to introduce their business and tell you about their business. It's going to be their elevator pitch for you. So that'll be the first thing. So go ahead. I'm going to let Mariko, Mariko go first. So. Good morning, everyone. Thank you again, Richard and everyone else for inviting me to be a speaker today. I'm honored to be here. So my name is Marika Lewis, and I am the owner and CEO of Social USA. We are a home defense company located right here in Cleveland Heights. We actually have office space located in the Rockefeller building. We have been in business since 2019, and we basically help other self-defense companies get started. We do a whole e-commerce setup, and we also have self-defense inventory. We sell non-lethal self-defense products such as pepper sprays and stun guns. We also have a consumer portion of our business where it's basically business to consumer. And so we do sell single items to people looking to be protected. But what we basically do on a bigger scale is wholesale and distribute self-defense products to other smaller self-defense businesses in the United States. Thank you. And I, I have participated. I purchased some of her products for my family. I, I have ladies in my family. So everybody has their own defense packet, you know, colorfully mm -hmm. designed. So I encourage you to reach out to Mariko for your self-defense product. <laughs> Thank okay, you, Rico. Right. <laughs> my name is Sarah Bartlett. Uh, my pronouns are she and her, and my business is called Mod Network. It is a consultancy focused on organizational development and change management. And so what that means is for businesses, I offer consulting on projects around efficiency, process improvement, um, increasing your operations, and essentially making that change that you've got in mind possible. Also offer training and development services. If you want to do leadership training for your staff or one-on-one -on -one, uh, training, I can do that as well. And on the individual side, I do a mix of executive coaching, um, work with leaders uh, or soon-to-be leaders on um, helping get ready to go. So that's a little bit about me and I'm in Cleveland Heights. And I work out of my home. <laughs> so. Okay, thank you, sir. Um, first question is I have for Mariko. Mariko, how have you been able to utilize social media to grow and scale your business? Uh, thank you. Great question, Richard. I've been able to utilize social media to grow my business tremendously, actually. One of my um, social media pages has over 16,000 followers. And I would say just creating content is very, very important. And you need to create content frequently on social media. 
I also utilize hashtags, which is major. A lot of people don't understand the power of using hashtags, but the power of using hashtags in your business, you want to utilize hashtags that are relevant to your business. So my business, for instance, is a self-defense company. And so I would use hashtag self-defense, hashtag pepper spray, and other hashtags that are really relevant to my business. And what it does is it gets you in the timeline of other people looking for those particular products or your type of business. And then I also would tag the location. So if I'm in Cleveland Heights, I would tag Cleveland Heights. And what it does is it gets more eyes on your business and it creates more followers for you as well because people that are interested in what you offer, they will begin to follow you. Um, one of the big things that people use on Instagram, especially if you're a business, is reels. A lot of people are really afraid to go live because they don't know how they're going to sound. They don't know how many people are going to join. And so you can't really worry about who's watching, who is joining your live or who is liking. You'd be surprised. Some of my posts that have the least amount of likes has got my business the most amount of sales. So it's not always how many likes you have. You can't worry about that. All you, all you can do is just really create the content and the people will come and they will come organically to you. So that's really, really important. And also I would say when you utilize social media, you can do multiple posts at one time. So you don't have to go to Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter and do all of these separate posts. The way that they have set it up now is that things are very integrated. So when I post on my Instagram page, I'm actually able to post on my Twitter, my Facebook, Tumblr, and other social media outlets at the same time. So one post is being spread across multiple social media networks. And so I would say that utilizing social media, especially today, is very important. People are on their phones all the time. And so if you're not utilizing social media for your business, you're really missing a big, a big market that, you know, will come to your business or will find out about your business. Things have changed. You know, everyone's not reading the paper anymore. Everything's online. And so you as a business owner must be online in order to really, really capitalize off of just getting to people and just being in front of people nonstop. Thank you for that great information, Mariko. That was, some, that, that was a lot of good information you just gave us. So we appreciate that. All right, you're sorry, Thank you're you. next. Uh, your question is, what are three best business practices that every business should have? Mm, meet with your MBAC advisor. <laughs> Number one. No, but, but honest on that one, um, having a group of people, small group, I'd say, you know, three to five people who have an expertise in some element of your business and talk to them review different components, get them on your kind of personal board of directors. Um, for me, that person is Richard. And so having a regular conversation, how are things going? What am I thinking of? Is my price too low? Of course it is. Uh, so having that person whom you could talk to and, and get some candid feedback around. So I think that's extremely important. The second thing that I think is really important is also trusting yourself. You are an expert in your own field, right? While Richard knows a lot about the things that Richard knows, Richard doesn't know everything that I know about my business. So it's a conversation and I don't just do everything that someone else says. I listen, I understand, and I know that I've done a lot of the research too. So trusting myself, I think, is the second most important thing in addition to trusting those advisors that I have. The third part, which I think Brian kind mm -hmm. of um, teed off is understanding the financials and thinking about it long term. So that both means on the revenue and the expense side. Um, I have a tendency of just sitting on cash because I'm afraid to spend it because I don't want to yes. lose it. <laughs> so um, th th that's nice to sit on cash. At the same time, I'm sitting on cash when I could be investing it into the business in right. some way. So having a understanding of that. And I found that financial professionals I meet with, for example, a lot of SBDCs have free um, consultants or advisors you can talk to about financials, and they have a lot of depth in that area. So if you don't understand how your income statement works, ask. If you don't understand the balance sheet, ask. Um, and there's always someone who can provide you a bit more education in that area. So I think the financials are a really big piece to understand where the money's going and 
do I like where the money is going? So those are the three things I'd pick, Richard. Thank you, sir. Those are great. Those are three great items that uh, every business needs to know about. So you did, you know, you did well. So thank you so much. Um, Mariko, question for you. How is important is it for your business to collaborate with other businesses? How important is collaboration for your business? Collaboration is very important, as well as partnerships. I think that all businesses need to consider collaborating with other businesses and just connecting and, you know, networking with other businesses. Again, you know, collaboration is another great opportunity for a business owner to expand their reach and their customer base. So collaboration is very important. Thank you. Um, and the last question for both of you, because our time is short. I have a lot more questions, but just don't have time to ask them all today. So, um, so the, the last question I have for both of you, uh, sorry, you can go for it next, is how has partnering with the Entrepreneurship Center helped you to grow and scale your business? I think that partnering with the Entrepreneurship Center has given me confidence about my business, which has helped me reach out to colleagues I might not have talked about my marketing plan in a different way. But there's also, I think, a benefit that, and I, I always forget this, um, the advisors I meet with, they work with other companies too. And so if they know someone who does something similar to me and may be ahead of where I'm at or coming to the point where I'm at, I can learn from them too. And so they can make introductions and get me connected with other people who do similar work to I do. And to Mariko's point earlier, networking within my industry is extremely helpful. Um, and it's really uh, validating to hear from other entrepreneurs about like, Maybe it's just hard <laughs> or, you know, maybe it's going really well or is someone else having this kind of challenge? So um, having access to kind of a different network and encouraging me to reach out to those people that I already have in my network. So I think that's been um, a, a, maybe a non-tangible benefit, but I think that's really helped. And I, I've appreciated that um, confidence building from the Entrepreneurship Center. Maybe not the answer you were expecting, Richard. But. <laughs> That's the answer we needed. That's yeah, you know, because we provide many different resources and pointed out another element that we provide that maybe I didn't think about. So I thank you for that information. Thank you for sharing that. Uh, same question for you, Mariko. Yes. So I agree with Sarah in regards to the confidence that you all have you know, put in me. I remember when I first started my business, I just felt like a really small business. I also was at home originally. I was at home for a few years before I decided to take the leap to get my own space. But I would say the biggest thing is just making sure all your ducks are in a row. That was one of the biggest things that um, they have helped me with as far as growing my business in regards to just your taxes and everything. You know, this is a workshop for pre-certification and you can't get certified if your things are not in order. You know, you're not paying your taxes. You don't have the proper licenses in place. They also helped me with my business plan as well. I had a, a business plan, but it wasn't up to par. And so they really helped me as Shoshana was speaking on earlier, as far as the analysts that they have, they helped me plug in certain numbers that I didn't have. They had, they really helped me hone in on where I was going, where I was at, and how I would get there. And so I would say, you know, any business owners that are on here, please reach out to the entrepreneur centers and the minority business assistance centers, and they will really help you start and grow from where you are. So don't be afraid if you're just beginning, If even if you just have some ideas, you don't want to go too far off and you're not receiving assistance from some of these wonderful organizations that are in place. They can really, really help you. So I, I just thank all of them, honestly, because like Sarah said, I have more confidence and I just feel like my business is ready to go to the next level. And it would not have been, not be able to go to the next level if it wasn't for the entrepreneurship centers helping me. Well, thank you so much, Mariko. Thank you so much, Sarah. Thank you for your, your insight, your feedback. And that's one thing I keep hearing is feedback. It's important to get feedback about your business. You don't really know. It's like you can't be afraid of getting that feedback and asking the mm -hmm. question, how am I doing or what can I do better? You know, and we always believe in it's It's important to always try to improve. You're doing something right. Let's see how we can improve on that. So that's one of our themes or our model here at the impact. We all we are always trying to improve. So, again, our time is short. I, I thank you for your time. Thank you for taking time out your busy schedule to be with us for our panelist discussion. At this time, I'm going to turn it back over to April. Thank you, Richard. Thank you. You're welcome.
Yes, thank you so much, Richard. <laughs> that was a wonderful discussion. Thank you so much, everyone. Okay, so we are going to move on to our last portion of our workshop today. Uh, we have Michael Lester from the state of Ohio, and he's going to talk about uh, certification and the different types of certification that the state of Ohio has to offer. Hi, Michael. Hey, hey, good morning. Thanks for the introduction. Um, as April said, my name is Michael Lester. I'm a state EEO contract officer, and I process um, a majority of or I process applications that come in for our MB certification, EDGE certification, um, and WB certification as well. So I'll go over our programs um, and how they could benefit you and then um, accept any questions at the end if, if there are any. So I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen. Can everybody see that? Yes, we can see it. Okay. Okay, so the uh, the first certification program we're going to talk about today is our Veteran Friendly Business Enterprise Program, or VBE. This program is for all procurement categories. The program also establishes an overall preference system of VBE certified businesses, which is different than our other programs, and I'll explain. When responding to an invitation to bid or ITB, a VBE certified business can quote up to 5% more than a non-certified competitor and will be eligible to win the award. Or in a request for a proposal or RFP, scores on proposals submitted by a VB certified business can be up to 5% lower than the proposal scores submitted by a non-certified competitor and still be eligible for winning that award. Um, just for your general information, um, if, you're, if you're interested in the VB programs and how that can be applied and uh, other general information, um, Wayne McNulty and David Walker, two points of contacts I listed here, they're both very helpful um, and very beneficial in the, in the search of VB contracts and VB information, so they can definitely help you out there too as well. Our next program is probably our most high profile program, and that is the Minority Business Enterprise or our MBE program. The MBE program establishes a 15% set aside goal for state agencies, boards, and commissions. Set aside means that those contracts and purchases must be solicited and awarded in the shelter market. What that means is that only MBE certified businesses can be a part of the solicitation pool. So you're not competing against any of the Ohio Health, Hondas, or other large um, businesses that are in the state. The MBE program is the ethnicity or race-based certification program also. It is for goods and services only. Mind you, goods and services can include IT and professional services. However, something to note, it does not include construction. Um, that is not to say the construction companies do not or cannot get certified, but how they utilize the certification is a little different, and we'll get into that later as well. So as I mentioned, each agency board and commission has a 15% requirement. Our office does monitor their expenditures and work with agencies towards meeting that requirement. To put 15% 15 into perspective of dollars, the state spent $298.8 million with 314 MB certified businesses last year, or 21.5% of that 1.39 billion eligible budget. Imagine what a fraction of those dollars could do to help grow and develop your business. So we're talking about opportunities available for you today. Our third program is called Encouraging Diversity, Growth and Equity, or EDGE. EDGE is designed to be an ethnicity and gender neutral and is to assist socially and economically disadvantaged businesses get state contracting. Here are some differences to know between the MB and EDGE. As I mentioned, this is for socially and economically disadvantaged businesses, and we'll clearly define what that is. The social disadvantage is uh, in a moment. But it's not an either or, you do have to be both socially and economically disadvantaged. Also, this program is also for agencies, board and commissions, and state universities. The goal for EDGE gets set each year by the director of BAS. Traditionally, it has been 5%. While the goal percentage itself may be smaller than MBE, it's a smaller percentage of a much larger pie. EDGE applies to more than just goods and services. EDGE applies to all procurement categories, construction, architecture, and engineering, professional services, goods and services, and information and technology services. And when you add all those into a construction budget, that's a lot of money to deal with. Another key difference about EDGE, you might have heard previously about the time limit for the EDGE program that has been removed with new updates to the Ohio Administrative Code. What has not changed, however, is that it is for small businesses with the new 
Ohio administrative changes, we have more closely mirrored those of the small business definitions that of the US Small Business Administration or SBA. So while there's no longer a time limit for being in the program, there's still a size standard for both the owner and the business. And if either exceed those thresholds, a business will be considered to graduate because they no longer need the benefits of the program. And we'll talk about those standards a little later. Similar to MB, your office does monitor and work with agencies toward meeting the goal. But again, let's put into perspective what 5% means. In fiscal year 2020, out of the total 4.83 billion in eligible budget, 7.21% was spent in either agency direct or subcontracting spending. In dollars, the state spent 348 million with 378 air certified businesses last year. For the ladies with us today, the state's newest program is designed for you. The women-owned business enterprise went into effect October 9th of 2020. And this is the first time that the state of Ohio has had certification program specifically, specifically for women entrepreneurs. The first key difference with the program is that currently the program does not have an established procurement goal or targets for state agencies to spend towards. It also does not have the applied purposes as we discussed for VBE. However, what it does have is a reciprocity component. And while still in development, the program allows the state of Ohio to enter into reciprocity agreements with other states who have similar WB programs. Once these agreements are finalized, this will allow an Ohio WB to take their certification to another state and apply for certification in that state and then compete in that state as a certified WBE and bid on the WB set aside contracts in that state. This component will hopefully broaden the opportunity and landscape for women owned businesses to grow in the state. While there are not any finalized agreements currently, we're still um, working on completing those agreements with some other states. So please just keep an eye on um, our website, the wbe.ohio.gov listed here at the bottom and um, keep in contact with your inbox to learn more as we develop the program. So we talked about what, but the biggest question we normally get is why, why should I get certified or what's in it for me? We've already touched on one of the biggest reasons, opportunity. These certification programs provide access to certain state procurement opportunities that otherwise your business might not have access to specifically in the case of MBE and that shelter market you could bid in. Additionally, we list all certified businesses and databases that not only agencies use, but a lot of universities, prime contractors, private corporations, et cetera. Often when someone has a need to locate a minority company, they'll search our database for businesses. There's also financial benefits to being certified, especially in the MBE program. Our partners at the Developmental Service Agency or DSA have several loan and bond programs specifically designed for certified businesses. Your local MBAC who is sponsored by DSA has information about those programs and can help you determine which programs best meet your needs and how to apply. Excuse me. A couple other things to consider is that certification is not limited to just state procurement. That is what the program was design, were designed for, but especially in today's social climate, so many corporations and agencies, both public and private, have realized that having a strong, diverse supplier base is good for business and good for the community. So while certification does provide you access to certain state government opportunities, it can also be viewed as a great marketing tool. Lastly, as you're considering outside businesses, also consider other certified businesses, your certified peers. What is it that you provide that perhaps another certified business has a need for, vice versa? Expanding how you look at the certification, even outside of state procurement, can also help you expand your customer base. Now let's talk about who, who could be eligible for certification. Let's start again with the VBE. Please note that only, only one of these criteria need to be met. Obviously, as a program is for veterans, if, you're, if the business is owned by a veteran or someone on active service, that person could qualify. If 51% of the board of directors are veterans or on active service, if the business has already received certification by the U.S. Department of Veteran Affairs as a small, or I'm sorry, as a service disabled veteran owned small business or veteran owned small business and owners meet the definition of veteran, we recognize that certificate as well. Lastly, if 10% of the business employees are veterans or on active service, it could qualify. This last one is nice because in a way, the program not only helps veteran business owners, but it also helps veterans find or maintain employment. And I mentioned this because if you're in business and plan 
plan you were looking to hire a workforce in the next two years from now you can keep in the program in mind if you hire veterans for your workforce it helps veterans find jobs but it also could benefit you by making your business eligible for this program okay switching to mbe edge and wbe programs these are all core requirements for all um, firstly, a full-time resident of the state of Ohio, with the exception of those who will apply from the approved reciprocity states once the WB program gets going um, in the reciprocity agreement. So currently, anybody that's applying for certification now must be an Ohio resident. The business must be a for-profit and in business at least one year. And we do truly mean in business, not just register with the Secretary of State's office. We do understand you might not have generated revenue, but you must be able to document how you have been in business. And again, this is where your impact is a great resource to help you document that information. Um, you must possess requisite knowledge of the business and industry and day-to-day -day control demonstrating capability and expertise. This is another key component for us as we're looking not to certify businesses who have minorities or women as owners on paper, but in actuality do not control the business. This defeats the purpose of the program, so you will need to demonstrate how you both own and control the day-to-day -day operations of your business. Specifically for MBE, as I said, it is an ethnicity or race-based certification program, so you need to be either African-American, American Indian, Asian, or Latino. If you don't fall in one of these groups, you will not meet the program criteria for the MBE. And for EDGE, the program is for socially and economically disadvantaged businesses. Socially disadvantaged can be because of someone's ethnicity, female gender, chronic, physical, or mental disability, a business owner's long-term residence in a hub zone. And the hub zone is an area defined by SBA through census tracts. Generally speaking, these areas are, are of low income and or high unemployment. You'll find both metropolitan areas as well as Appalachia are hub zones. And there's a link on our website where you can enter the address of, um, of an individual or a business to determine if that address is an approved hub zone area. Something to note, if you are applying based on being in a hub zone, 35% of your business's workforce must also reside in a hub zone. They don't have to be in the same hub zone as the business, but they need to be located in the hub zone as well. <clears throat> Economic disadvantage is based primarily on the personal net worth Following the SBA guidelines, we do exclude the primary residents, if not owned outright, and any interest in the business. Upon entry and during the duration of the certification, a person's net will not exceed $750,000. However, as mentioned, we also use the SBA side standards. Those are based on NAX codes and could be based on either gross receipts of the business and or the number of employees held. And the fair market value of all assets must be less than $4 million. For WBE, the business must be owned and controlled by a woman, again, a full-time Ohio resident with the exception of those who apply from approved reciprocity states. As I mentioned before, until the state agreements are in place, everyone must be an Ohio resident. All right, we talked about what the programs are, why you should consider applying, and who qualifies. And next, um, we'll kind of go over how to get started with the certification process. <laughs> Excuse me. Before you start with an application, please start with the supporting document checklist. This task will likely take you the longest. Yes, there are a lot of items on the list. However, each item is designed to verify core requirements, specifically citizenship, residency, ethnicity or race, social and economic disadvantage, as well as ownership and control. Your local impact is available to help you with gathering these documents, identifying what you may be missing and document those gaps. They're a great resource right in your own backyard and they're free. And working with your inback on the front end um, will help streamline this process. The documents um, can be a lot um, for people um, applying for the first time. So definitely utilize your inbacks in those situations to help you uh, document those um, list of documents that you need to submit to us. And there are three certification options that a company can choose from based on its needs. And the two most used are um, our standard process and a fast track process. Um, this is a basic or standard process. On average, applications take about 60 to 90 days of process once you receive all the supporting documents needed. Again, inback in assistance is available when gathering those documents. We're looking to validate application information. Does what you put on the application 
match the documents received. Yet another reason to compile the documents before filling out the app, because if you use the documents to fill out your application, the data automatically matches. We're looking to verify ownership and control. We then analyze documentation and the information gathered during the interview, and the officer recommends either approval or disapproval for the certification. The recommendation goes to the state EEO coordinator for final review. If you are approved, you get an email saying, congratulations, you have been approved. Click here to get your certificate. However, if the coordinator agrees with the disapproval recommendation, you will receive a certified letter detailing what the next steps are because you do have the ability to appeal that decision. Um, for WBE, the process itself is the same with one notable exception. While our MBE and EDGE applications are located on our Ohio Business Gateway website, our WBE and VB applications are not there yet. So in the meantime, the WBE applications are available on our website, uh, the wbe.ohio.gov, as a fillable PDF. And the same is true for the VB application, except that it's an Excel form um, that you get from the website as well. <clears throat> for MBE and EDGE only, and only by working with an MBAC, there's an option to fast track an application. However, due to staffing levels and the fact that if we didn't build this criteria into this, then everyone will request it. This way, the process is only available if one of the following apply. An applicant uh, desires to submit a bidder proposal in response to a procurement solicitation and certification is a requirement to be responsive, meaning you are responding to an MBE set aside or edge contracting opportunity where you have to be certified in order to, for the bid to be accepted or has a pending DSA minority business development financing or bonding application where certification is a requirement. Again, you're applying for one of those DSA loans or bonding programs where you have to be certified in order for the application to be accepted by their board. In either instance, the process remains the same, except that you must work with the MBAC to gather and submit your documents and they will submit on your behalf as a fast track application. When that happens, there's one officer who receives those. All their packet processing stops for that officer and so they can focus on the fast track application. The timeline drops to about five to seven days. Again, very specific reason why this process is used. We would love to have the ability to process everyone's applications this quickly, but with five officers covering their entire state, that's just not feasible for us. And our final process is cross certification. This is currently available just for MBE, but we are looking at other options for the other programs currently. If you are already MBE certified with one of the listed certifications above, you could complete an expedited or a cross certification application from the Ohio Business Gateway and provide us with a copy of your current certification. We will then reach out to our partnering agency and request a letter of good standing. Once received, we will issue a certification to match the expiration date of that current certification you're holding. And also with the exception of OMSDC, these are all true reciprocal agreements. So say that you're certified with the state first and then decide that you wanna want or need a city certification, you can do the same thing and apply with that city, give them a copy of our certification and they'll reach out to us to verify and then get certified. Something to consider if you're interested in both MBE and EDGE, you would, need, you would still need to complete a unified application and submit all the supporting documents for the EDGE because this is only available for MBE at the time. Also, then your certification dates between the two programs will be on different dates, and that could become confusing to keep track of. Because of this, a lot of businesses opt to not cross-certify, but rather apply in the standard way so their certification dates match and it makes it easier to process when it comes time to recertify. Um, and here's um, just some general um, contact information for our office. Um, general phone number and um, our general email box as well. Um, so that was kind of an overview of all of our programs and how they could benefit you. Um, if anybody had general questions or any questions about our programs or wanted to go in depth about certain things, um, I'm, I'm available to answer questions now if we have time. Thank you so much, Michael. Do we have any questions that Michael can answer for you? Already, I don't see any, Michael. Uh, thank you so much for being here with us today and taking the time out of your day uh, to share all oh, this information with us. I do have a question. I'm sorry, Gina. Oh, absolutely. 
Yeah. So when you certify for, for these programs, are you able to, well, are they able to transfer from state to state, I guess? Um, well, so for our W, we're working on that for our WB program. A lot of our programs, the MB program and EDGE program is kind of in state. Um, we don't have any reciprocal agreements with those program with those programs. So most states won't deal with our, like if you have our MBE and try to go to like Indiana to use it, they won't deal with you because we don't allow them to come into our program at the time. But for our WB program, that's the main basis of our WB program is to be able to use that pro certification out of state. So we're kind of working with a lot of states to try to get them to set up reciprocal agreements with our WB program to allow our women in the state of Ohio to take that certification elsewhere. Um, it has been a little struggle for us to, to finalize some of these agreements, but we are working on those. So I would look into the WB program and kind of maybe apply for that and just listen to um, listen out for our updates. So when we finally get some, uh, some of those reciprocal agreements in place, you'll be able to use that certification in other states. Perfect, thank you. Mm -hmm. Any others? As far as confirmation goes with um, receiving acceptance of the cross certifications, I believe that's what it's called. Um, do we receive separate um, confirmations for all of the different um, MBEs that we would have qualified for, or it's just understood that once the information is submitted, it's just accepted? Uh for the cross certification, um, it's, it's, it's more so just like kind of a waiting. If you if you have one of those certifications that I, I had up there and looking to apply for the state, it's more that's more so waiting. As long as your certification is in good standing, um, once you apply for that certification, that cross certification, it's just about us connecting with that agency, making sure that certification is in good standings, and then we'll approve it. So it's just about uh, that's more so of a waiting game than it is about providing information because you already have that certification and went through the channels of supplying the documents to that agency. And we kind of agreed that our processes are close enough that it can just transfer over. So that's more so kind of a waiting game. Thank you. Any more questions? Alrighty then. Thank you so much, Michael, for being here. We really appreciate it. I'm the palm. Thank you for having me. Yes, absolutely. Thanks, Michael. Thank you, Michael. Good to see you all, as always. Thank you. Thank you. It's good seeing you all today. You too. I'd like to turn it over to our um, to our guest, Deanna Deanna Fisher, to see if she has any last words um, for future pipes that she would like to say before we start wrapping up. Thank you, April. It's just been really great to to meet all of you. I'm I'm so grateful that you've taken the time to share information about doing business in Cleveland Heights and some of the resources that are available to you. Um, Future Heights is, as I mentioned, a, an organization that connects the community uh, to our local businesses. We're, we're here to help. So if we can provide connections to you, please reach out to us. I'll put our information in the chat and I'm sure April will share our slides as well. Um, so I hope, uh, hope you all have a, have a great day and thank you so much for being here. Absolutely. Thank you so much. And yes, uh, once again, I will be sending up a follow up email with all of the contact information of our speakers and their PowerPoint slides, um, as well as our info email and back info at ulcleveland.com, where you can email and make an appointment with a business advisor. Uh, so we can talk about all this information that we went over with today. Do I have any last comments from the rest of my team? Well, we just, uh, yes, um, we just want to thank everyone for taking time out. Uh, we're thankful to be able to partner with Future Heights once again. Look forward to doing it again uh, next year. Um, so we're thankful for this opportunity. We're thankful for all the business owners who took the time out to, to join us for our pre-certification workshop, How to Business. Reach out to us if you need to get certified. We are your certification go-to team. So if you need to get certified, we are the people to reach out to. You can reach out to myself or my colleague, Andrea Boyd, and we will help you get certified. Um, additionally, we'll help you with uh, you know, technical assistance and procurement opportunities and access to capital. So NBAC has, we, we have a saying, we have our hashtag, NBAC has your back. So reach out to us today.
Great. Thank you, Thank you for that, Richard. Absolutely. Make sure you reach out to us and we can help you with all those items and more, all those services. We do offer um, business plan assistance as well uh, with MBAC that we could definitely help you get your business plan to where you need to be. And if just for Jenna Jones, um, you might want to get in contact with the Minority Business Development Agency. That will let you know exactly who you need to get in contact with for that national certification, the Minority Owned Business Certification that is um, for multiple states. It'll it'll give you the contact person for who you need to um, get in contact with for whichever state you're trying to, to certify for. Okay, what was the name of that? Um... Minority Business Development Agency. Okay. Mm -hmm. If you go onto their website, it'll let you know per, per state, per specific state, who what the number is and, and who the contact person is. Perfect, thank you. You're welcome. And also, I'd like to say, we, after the workshop today, you see there are so many great opportunities available to business owners in Cleveland Heights, University Heights. You just need to reach out and connect. I mean, there's so many resources available. There's no reason why you cannot grow and scale your business based on all the information that you received today. So just take that next step, take that initiative, be proactive, not reactive, and take that step and reach out and connect and get your business to the next level where you want it to go. Awesome. Thank you for that team. I do want to also add, um, also you all make sure that you're paying attention to your emails because we have a lot of great webinars that will be coming out after this one. And most of the time that information is communicated via email. So make sure you pay attention for additional opportunities, whether it's access to capital opportunity certification. I'm doing business with a um, organization, a company or a municipality. Make sure you're paying attention to your emails and looking out for those additional programs that are coming your way. Awesome. Thank you so much, Shoshana. And everyone have a wonderful day. Um, and we'll see you next time. Thank you so much. Thank you. Have a great day. Goodbye.